our application is running slow, so we traced it. That's a good thing. In the trace, we found thousands of internal SQLs, like select CNAME, UNAME from cons dollar, CDEF dollar, user dollar, uh, with join conditions, etc. Now they say, normally, and this is a paraphrased version of the question, they went on to say that normally you would expect to see lots of internal SQLs when you're doing lots of parsing. So if you've got a lot of literals in your application or your SQL, lots and lots of parsing means lots of dictionary queries to work out whether your query is valid, and you would see this kind of thing. That's one of the dangers of not using bind variables. But this person explained to me, we're using binds like we're supposed to. We're not doing much parsing. Why do these appear? I have to issue in a bit of an apology here. Because I'm an old, cynical database guy, when this question came in and they said, we're using binds and we're not parsing, I sort of responded with, yeah, sure, you're not parsing. Sure, you've got good code. Yeah, I've lost track of the number of times people have said, yeah, our code's great. Our code's really, really well. And then you go in there and it's just a parsing, literal SQL injection nightmare. But I must issue an apology. When we went and did some work, yes, there was actually nothing wrong with their application in terms of parsing. They were using a lot of pill SQL, a lot of bind variables. Uh, they were doing everything you would expect a good application to do. Yet still, the system was getting smashed with these internal queries. So let's explore why. So here's an explanation as to why you might see these kind of queries in your database traces or why they may have a dominant factor in your AWR reports, performance reports, stats back, et cetera, even though your application seems to be running as you'd expect with no parsing, no SQL injection, no literals. I'm going to create a table here, very simple, X and Y, it's got a constraint that Y has to always be greater than zero. Obviously, if I try and insert an invalid value into Y, I get an error. But the key thing here is look at the error message. It says your check constraint is violated. The check constraint was called CHK as per the definition. Now, how do you think the database returned that to you? That's what it had to do. When you violate a constraint or when you have any kind of error in which the object name in question needs to be presented to you, that is being done with a dictionary query. In this case, that query you just saw on the previous slide was exactly this query. When you violate a constraint, we query the internal table cons dollars, which has constraints, C def dollars, which is the constraint definitions, and user dollars, which is the name of the constraint or the owner. So the owner is, in this case, McDonald, that's my username I use here, McDonald Connor, and the name of the constraint, CHK. We had to run queries to return that error message to you. Applications generally aren't meant to fail. You don't get a lot of error messages coming back from applications. So why would this particular customer still be seeing so many of these queries, even though they're not getting error messages? Let's do a little bit of exploration as to where you might get caught out. I'm going to take my table now and insert the values 1 through 10. So we can see there's effectively the values 1 through 10. And here's a real common application model or coding model that people use. They've got an API which says, yep, I need to add or update the value of Y for a given value of X. And this is very, very common. And people say, well, I'm going to try insert a new value. But if that value is already there, then I'm just going to update it. It's homegrown merge. It's a very common model you see, especially when people say most of the time I'm expecting insert to work or most of the time I'm expecting update to work and they flip it around. But it's a really common model. And because of that, if I go run this routine, say I'm going to update the values Y and run it lots and lots of times, it's a busy application. As we can see, because we captured the exception, there was no errors. This application is running just fine. So let's flush out my share pool and see what my trace file is. There's my current trace file. Turn on SQL trace and I'll run that same little routine again. Flush out my trace file. I disconnect on Windows. I run a TK prof on this so I can actually see the trace file. And because I know the SQL ID of the um, internal SQL for this particular example, I can just grep the uh, right amount using awk to get the right part of the trace file out. As you can see, even though we never returned an error message to the application, we still had to go work it out because in exceptions in PL SQL, and in fact, in exceptions in any driver you've got to the Oracle database, one of the pseudo functions we populate is SQL error message. We don't know if you're going to actually utilize that in your exception handler, whether it's in PL SQL, Java, Node, etc. So we have to be able to send it back to you just in case you want to reference it. So for that reason, because I tried to update Y 10 times, I did a loop of a thousand, uh, a loop of a hundred, 1000 times I executed this query. 
which is go to the constraint table and the constraint definition and the username and find the constraint name and the owner name. This is where you'll start to see these internal queries, even though your application is correct. Because you're getting exception handlers and you're grabbing exception errors, you're effectively still going through the process of populating error messages. And that in means lots of internal queries. The, the takeaway from all of this is the Oracle database, <laughs> this sounds like a cliche, this sounds like me putting on like a sales hat, but it's not. This. The Oracle database is, is optimized for success. It's the same reason why if you do a billion row changes and hit commit, it does that. But if you type in rollback, it takes an hour. We're always assuming that your successful results are what you want to be the fastest. And so if you're doing things like insert and then catching an error and doing an update, the way you would get around that is, first of all, if you would have refactor the code, you would look at changing it to a merge. A merge means you're never going to have that error because a merge deals with the insert and the update overlap. If the insert and update were being done, for, for example, as from different parts of your application and therefore a merge became no longer possible, you'd hope that wouldn't be the case. But if it was, then what you would do is you would monitor application and say, what's the success rate? Is it better that I do the insert and then fall through to update, or is it better that I do the update and then fall through to insert? Minimize the amount of dictionary queries uh, based on those kind of metrics. But ultimately, the less time you capture and then ignore an error from the Oracle database, the faster it runs. Even if you had insert where not exists because of concurrency, sometimes that would still create an error and fall through to the update. You would minimize the amount of times you would fall through to the update because the not exists uh, would at least catch them most of the times. So anything like that, which limits the amount of times you actually grabbed an exception and then ignored it, uh, is going to dramatically improve or dramatically reduce the amount of dictionary queries you do internally. Mm -hmm.